And as I was going through it, I had found a whole mouse in the spinach. And my reaction was rather calm at first. That local college student says he found a dead mouse in his salad at the school's dining hall, and he has video to prove it. It happened right before he took a bite. Valley News Team's Joshua Pagaro spoke to the student and has his story. Isaac Oliphant was sitting at the Minnesota State University Moorhead cafeteria with his friends. I normally don't eat at the school very often. I normally make my own food at home, but I had someone use a guest pass for me. It was his first time eating at Keezy Commons, and he says it will be his last after finding a dead mouse in his salad. My reaction was rather calm at first. I wasn't super, like, taken aback by it, not because I would expect there to be a mouse in my spinach. His friends at the table were recording it. The dragon <laughs> I just think kids do pay quite a lot of money for the meal plans here, and especially freshmen who are required to have some form of a meal plan for living on campus here that there should be a standard upheld. We asked MSUM for an on-camera interview and they declined, instead choosing to release a statement that read in part the health and safety of their students are their top priority. MSUM blames the food company Sodexo, which provides most of the food across the campus. Sodexo tells us it's investigating the incident and the salad was provided by a vendor. We showed other students the mouse video and as you might expect, I don't really want to go and eat there again after seeing this. I wouldn't really trust the food, to be honest. In the meantime, Oliphant says he doesn't blame the school, but he says he wishes the school had alerted students after it happened instead of hiding it. In Moorhead, Joshua Pagaro, Valley News Live. MSUM wouldn't tell us whether they'll be canceling their contract with Sodexo. The university does say in their nearly 15-year relationship with them, this is the first time an incident like this has happened. The man who admitted to throwing a five-year-old boy from a balcony at the Mall of America is appealing his conviction. Emmanuel Aranda entered a guilty plea to a charge of first-degree attempted murder in May in exchange for a 19-year sentence. According to a criminal complaint, the 24-year-old told police that he had planned to kill someone at the mall the day before. But it did not work out, so he returned again the next day. He said he had planned to kill an adult but chose the boy instead. The five-year-old boy returned home this week after four and a half months of medical care, according to his family. Moorhead police are asking for your help finding 43-year-old Casey Crompton. Crompton has multiple open warrants, including two for felony stalking and burglary. If you have any information on his whereabouts, you can call law enforcement. A local school's effort to get kids moving and fight obesity also battles bullying. Hillsborough Elementary School principal John Dryberg says he applied for a grant to install speakers outside the building. He thought that playing music during recess would inspire the kids to dance and get some exercise. And it did. What he also found out was that the music helped the kids unwind and get along. When I play music outside, uh, it just seems like they, they're more relaxed with each other. And then when they go back inside, if they didn't have issues at recess, then I don't see them in my office because of issues in the afternoon either. Principal Dryberg says he's outside with the kids for recess every day. He adds the kids are outside dancing to music a whole winter until it gets 20 below. When you hear the words school lockdown, scary images often come to mind, and that is what area school districts are trying to avoid. They're using new terminology to better describe difficult situations. Valley News Team's Katie Opperly looks at the difference between a lockdown and a newly termed hallway closure. It's a good thing to be able to use plain English and just be very clear and specific about what's happening in our buildings. As of this school year, Fargo and West Fargo schools are part of 16 districts that are now using the terms lockdown and hallway closure to make sure no one is confused about what is happening during an emergency or threat. A lockdown is a term that we use when there is a true threat to the students and staff of a building. So a hallway closure is exactly that. We are closing the hallways because of a low level incident that 
that is occurring. That would include a medical emergency like an asthma attack or seizure or a student crisis such as a behavioral issue. A hallway closure allows class to continue without disruption. A lockdown, however, requires extreme safety measures, including stopping class, staying quiet and staying out of sight from doors and windows. We're hoping that it alleviates any fear or concern for students, but then also helps parents in the community understand more what is happening in our building. So not everything is a lockdown because lockdown means something scary and in general, those don't happen in our schools. With this being the first year many districts are using the new terms, they're interested to hear what people think. I think it would be helpful for uh, parents to know that uh, uh, something happened at school but not have the fear of a lockdown. Lockdown always uh, gives an indication that something terrible happened. I think it'd be like helpful for, I guess, the staff to know like the difference between if there's someone actually dangerous on the premises or if it's kind of not that big of an emergency. At the end of the day, it's all about making sure our kids are safe. In West Fargo, Katie Opperly, Valley News Live. West Fargo Public Schools recently sent out school emergency information, which includes the difference between a lockdown versus a hallway closure. To read it, head to our website, valleynewslive.com. A Fargo business is looking to make major security changes after several thefts over the last year. Fargo Tractor called our whistleblower hotline saying the most recent crime was caught on camera. Lawn mowers, trailers and tractor batteries have been stolen from the lot over the past year. They already have security cameras and now are looking at other security measures, such as possibly putting a fence around the area. It's kind of frustrating to come into work and see you're missing missing equipment off the lot and then the time to you know try and track some of that stuff down police tell us they are looking at the surveillance footage now to figure out who the person in the video is fargo's trying to catch up after monday's destructive storm high winds knocking down trees and power lines creating quite a mess. The city says they have a full staff up in North Fargo working. That's the part of town they say took the hardest beating. They also say it's going to be another two weeks before those tree limbs disappear. The main thing that people can help us out with is uh, when they put their branches and, or brush out on the boulevard, uh, try to stack it nice and neat. For now, you can take your branches to the landfill free of charge. Some people living in West Fargo are slipping and sliding on a patch of slimy sidewalk in the Arbor Glen neighborhood. They consider it a safety hazard. And they want the city to do something about it. But as Valley News Team's Courtney Lockie found out, it might not be that easy. Runners, dog walkers, and bikers alike say they've noticed a couple of slippery patches along the sidewalk at 17th Avenue East and 16th Street East near Cheney Middle School. Whether they've slipped on it themselves or saw it happen to someone else, they say the gooey mess is a safety hazard. It's definitely a problem because I feel like someone could seriously get injured. Yeah, especially for like little kids. Paige and Leah are eighth graders at Cheney Middle School. They ride their bikes to and from school every day. And they say they've slipped on this patch of slime a few times themselves, including once today. We ride our bikes here every day and like it hasn't left and it's been here since like the snow dried and like when we walk, we almost slip. Communications director for the city of West Fargo, Melissa Richards says they have received multiple reports about the hazardous sidewalk, but when they sent a crew to check it out, they didn't think it was a big deal. Our code enforcement department did go out and check it. Um, when they got there, they didn't see anything that rose to the level of a violation that they would follow up on. And although the city said that the amount of slime on the sidewalk wasn't enough to cause a problem, many people in this neighborhood had a different opinion. They can be wet with foam and green stuff growing on them and they're super slimy. And uh, I personally don't think they're very safe because I slip on them quite few times. Richard says anytime there is something on the sidewalk, mud, slime or snow, it's a concern. But she says it's not always the city's job to take care of it. Sidewalks in the city are public property, but they are the responsibility of the property owner who is adjacent to the sidewalk to maintain. Richard says the city operates on complaints. And if you have a problem, give them a call. In West Fargo, Courtney Lockie, Valley News Live. Richard says you can call the Code of Enforcement. The phone number's on your screen right now, 701-433-5400 for these kinds of concerns. 
A coalition of North Dakota tribes is unveiling a new marketing strategy to promote tourism on the reservations. The North Dakota Native Tourism Alliance and North Dakota Tourism hope to launch a new, uh, some new tourism packages for visitors to experience tribal cultures. By the spring of 2020, each individual tribe will create a unique tourism package featuring museum visits, viewing buffalo herds, and even staying overnight in a teepee. Uh, tourism in North Dakota brought in more than $3 billion in 2016. Board members are hoping to take part in that economy to fund infrastructure projects on reservations. Valley News Live 10 at 10 continues with no wait weather. What a great day of weather, and we ended it in style as well. Some of those clouds from up north drifted in our general direction at sunset, creating a gorgeous and colorful time lapse here from our Valley Sky Cam to close out the day. And more colorful sights captured by our very own uh, Bailey Hurley out there. This is the tree in front of our studios here at Valley News Live. And Yes, I think it's making up its mind that fall may be here a little early. It sure feels that way with temperatures that have been below average the last few days. It is 63 and for the most part clear right now. Wind from the southeast at under 10 miles per hour. It's 61 at Moorheads Airport and look at the 50s already mid 50s from Thief River Falls eastbound into Beltrami County where Bemidji's at 55. 61 Grand Forks and Jamestown 66 degrees at this hour. We do see a few echoes on the radar in the Northern Valley. Not all of this is reaching the ground, but we had some lightning uh, with some cells to the northwest of Langdon. These in southern Canada working their way eastward, and we do have a chance for some thunderstorms as we go through the overnight hours as some of this energy works its way to the south and east. But more on that in a second in your hour by hour forecast. Here's a 10 o'clock look at Hurricane Dorian spinning its wheels off the coast of Georgia. Heavy rain bands just offshore right now with some intense winds and the storm strengthening since we last spoke. 115 mile per hour sustained winds with gusts to 140 miles per hour. It is moving north at a slow crawl of seven miles per hour. Uh, Dorian is expected to continue along the coast very close to North Carolina and Hatteras could take a hit the way this uh, latest forecast trend is showing with winds that will still be well over 100 miles per hour. For us, pretty quiet conditions as we go through the evening hours and as we go into the overnight is when we'll have that best chance of showers and storms developing mainly after two, maybe three o'clock. So you may be awakened by thunder and lightning. Some of these storms could have some large hail. There's going to be enough energy in the atmosphere to produce some hail. Notice that they stay mainly north of Highway 2, moving through the northern valley at around 3 or 4 a.m. and then into northwest Minnesota for the early morning hours. Temperatures, though, nowhere near those frost producing temperatures we saw this morning. Temperatures in the 50s to start beautiful for the first part of the day. We're going to have variable winds from the south for the early part of the day, then switching around and becoming northerly as we go through the afternoon. Most of us on our afternoon stay dry with the exception of a possible sprinkle in the north. Here's a look at your planning forecast. Mid to upper 50s to start your day. Temperatures rising up into the mid 70s with mostly sunny skies in the early half of the day. Maybe some late clouds and a lot of us in eastern North Dakota in the 70s, a few 60s in western Minnesota. Here's another gorgeous shot of Mamatis clouds. Tara capturing these at sunset. Here's a look at your planning forecast and a fabulous Friday in the mid 70s here, quiet weather and dry on the Saturday, a very good chance of scattered showers and storms. Right now, it looks like the southern half of our viewing area will have the best chance at seeing those showers and brr, look at those highs in the 60s through the weekend and into early next week. You're trying to ignore those 60s. We are anyway, you know. Do the best you're looking, you can. Yes. You're looking for 80s. <laughs> We're just delivering the uh, facts. Here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thanks. Ed. You bet. Up next on